We have, uh, you know, I'm going to talk about, we could talk Weekend and Bernie's, we could talk Last Starfire, Catherine Mary Stewart. Catherine, thanks for stopping by. How are you? I'm good. How are you guys? I, I'm doing amazing. And you can you imagine, like, when you think about some of these iconic movies you've been in? I mean, it's just like crazy to think about how they just last forever and, 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 and people remembering yeah, they they seem to have had some longevity to them for sure. Or, you know, it was like, I think that what happened with the, like Last Starfighter and Night of the Comet is they found their feet in video in, mm -hmm. in yeah, and um, became really, really popular for kids that these were the kind of movies that they were allowed to watch on their own. And in some cases they were like babysitters for these uh kids and they got to know them so well and played them over and over and over again and became passionate about them and then you know fast forward to like 20 years later and you're doing these conventions and you have these super fans that you never in a million years expected to you know show up it, it's so it's it's really i'm so i feel so grateful so grateful to be a part of these movies for sure. And they become communities. And we'll talk further about that. Go ahead, mm. Greg, first question. Yeah, it's great. So, so uh, did you know you always wanted to be an actor? Or like, when did you decide? And so, well, no, I, I didn't. I come from a very academic family. So it was kind of, this was sort of outside the wheelhouse kind of a thing. <laughs> but my mother kind of recognized pretty early that, yeah, not so much an academic. Um, so, uh, she, I was very skinny, I want to say when I was a kid. <laughs> so she got me into ballet when I was really young because I was always pretty animated around the house. It, it, there was definitely a performer in there dying to get out. Um, I hated ballet because it was so regimented. Then I got into gymnastics and she sort of tried art on me and all this other stuff. Eventually, she kind of tricked me into going into dance, into this dance class. And um, I fought her tooth and nail. I was like, no, I hate dance. I hate ballet. And um, I, I but I we made this agreement that if I hated it after the first class, I would I wouldn't have to go back. Well. I got in there, went to the very back of the room. I was like, this is going to be, you know, this is dead on arrival, man. I loved it. I loved it. And then the teacher brought me to the front because I was picking it up really quickly. And that sort of began my onstage performing career. My mother also, God bless her, got me into... Um, drama class in school which i also fought her i fought her on everything because i'm like i don't want to stand in front of a bunch of people and recite shakespeare you know <laughs> so but she convinced me to do it i i loved it i loved being able to like express myself through characters because although i was very animated at home and you know a handful i'm sure I was basically really super shy. So this gave me an opportunity to express myself. And um, I, but I really pursued the dance. I was in a company, I'm from Canada originally. I was in a company called Synergy. We traveled all over the world performing. And when I graduated from high school, I was quite young when I did all that. When I graduated from high school, I moved to London, England and um, went to this school called the London Studio Center, which focused on dance, but it was also kind of a per performing arts um, school. So it gave me, you know, built on the little bit of drama that I'd already done and gave me a real good foundation for what I fell into while I was in London. And you so talked about your <laughs> academic background. <laughs> That's surprising mm. in, I guess, the three movies you're most known for. You know what I mean? And yeah, I know. Better, right? Uh, but, you know, you need that academics to prepare you. But kind of tell us what's that what happened next in that process after you, you know, went to school in, in the UK. How did that develop into, you know, becoming an actor? Yeah. Um, so, uh, 
yeah, I was there and, and they would have like these dance auditions every once in a while for things like cruise lines and stuff like that, which I did. But one day um, on my way to class, I uh, ran into a couple of people that I took class with and they were going in the opposite direction. And I asked them what was going on. And they said, well, we heard about this audition for this movie. It's a rock musical and we're just going to check it out. It's open to anybody. So I thought, I'm going to just tag along and see what happens. So we get there and it's literally a cattle call audition. Most of the people were prepared with like, it was a, it was a musical. So most people were prepared with a song. They, you know, had their proper dance outfit on to make them stand out and all this other stuff. And the three of us kind of showed up and sort of, you know, kind of hid in the background again. But the director saw me and he thought that I looked right for the lead character in this movie. And so he pulled me out and he said, do you act? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> do you sing? Sure. <laughs> and so I ended up auditioning for him and it was the knock and go on. It was a movie called The Apple. It was a, a futuristic rock musical. And I quote, set in 1994. Because so that gives you some indication of how long ago it was. And um, I ended up landing the role. And so it, it was a it was a pretty serious um, movie. The, Menachem, he's, he was with a company called Canon Films, and he was really trying to break into the American film market. And at that time, there was, you know, Rocky Horror Picture Show, Xanadu, that kind of a thing. And he was trying to kind of figure all that out. I, I, I'm not sure that he was completely successful with the Apple, but that's, you know, that's up to you guys to decide, I guess, the audience. <laughs> but that is what got me going. And then it just kind of snowballed from there. Yeah. And I ended up moving to Los Angeles eventually. Yeah. So uh, Last Starfighter, that's uh, one of mine and my wife's favorite movies. We love that movie. We, we watch it at least every other year, if not every year once um so so tell us something you know about that what was it like doing it how much fun was it you know some yeah maybe some favorite moments or whatever that'd be cool yeah yeah that was sort of a, a dream like situation that was the first movie that i i did in in los angeles and um i was also on a soap opera at the same time so i was kind of it kind of overlapped a little bit which worked out okay um it, what was so lovely about The Last Starfighter, excuse me, I know this is um, is um, that it was, a, it was a real, it felt very intimate. And I mean, the, like Jonathan Batchel, who wrote the script, and Nick Castle, who directed, were friends, and, and they had this idea, and, uh, you know, and they got the funding, and it was just, they were, everybody seemed very young and very enthusiastic. And Nick was such a wonderful director for younger actors. Lance Guest, who played Alex, um, he and I were, you know, really not very well known. We'd done a couple of things here and there. Um, at the audition, I remember, you know, the Brat Pack, they were all there, but they really wanted to find lesser known actors, fortunately for Lance and me. And, um, Lance and I clicked pretty quickly. Um, I remember auditioning where we just, without the script, sort of in front of everybody. And they, they said, we just pretend you're at a lake, it's night, and you're looking up at the stars. And so we sort of made up this dialogue. It was different in the movie. Mm -hmm. um, it was a really lovely experience. It's, it's funny because I've been emailing with Lance today i mean we're, we're working on this project that we'd like to do together so um we'll see how that pans out because you know it's the 40th anniversary of the last starfighter this yeah. year oh. isn't that unbelievable yeah. i know so um we we really enjoyed working with each other and we stayed really good friends all these years which i also think when you have that kind of great chemistry it, it shows on on screen right so it's a lovely experience um 
a favorite moment. I mean, one of my favorite scenes in the in the thing is at the lake, the whole lake sequence where I'm I'm making out with a beta unit and he just doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> that was funny. It was so much fun. And then when he gets shot and there's like the sploop of this green stuff that comes out. And then, it, you know, there's the whole chase scene and there's action, there's explosions. I love you. I love you. So it's like it, it had everything in it. It was comedy, action, drama, um, love. <laughs> I love that sequence so much. So for the fans of The Last Starfighter, what would you say? Why do they like it? Why is it so iconic? 40 years later, still the, as yeah. I thought. Yeah, what do you think it is? Well, I feel like it was a very 80s movie, but it was one of a, a, a movie that the kids could really relate to, I think. You know, the characters were, were from Earth. They were, you know, humble young people going through what everybody goes through when they graduate from high school. It's this, just crazy shift that you have to somehow figure out and and i believe that the the audience identified with the characters and could put themselves in their shoes you know and and it's such an inspiring sort of story that you know yes he's just this ordinary guy in this crazy crazy situation but i think the message is you know you should reach for the stars because you never know what you might grab onto. Um, and that, so I think it's inspiration. I think they could totally identify with characters. Um, and that sticks with you, you know? It totally does. Yeah. I also feel like it, 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 it's, it, it's for kids that are at that really critical time in their life and to see it, on screen is, uh, you know, inspiring. That's very cool. So I know, I know, uh, Neil wants to ask you about, uh, weekend at Bernie's. Oh, <laughs> I, 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 the night of the comet or weekend of the Bernie's. <laughs> Let's go with night of the comet. Uh, cause I watched that later after it came out, like probably on video or something. Cause I definitely mm. the theaters, but mm. it's a scary thing. And so it's because of my last name's Haley, Haley's comment. So comet. there goes something where comments, it intrigued me, but it's a scare. It's a it's an interesting horror flick, and in, in so many ways, and it makes you think, right? And how, right, for and, sure. Right, tell us about your character and it to remind us and like and how that whole experience was of that, and how it finally you said blew up later, not just off the beginning. Right, very similar to the last Starfighter. It's it's a a, a different kind of movie. What I what attracted me to that movie was the fact that. You know, I did play a lot of sort of girl next door, sweet, innocent, virginal characters. And I love that Reg, you know, was an independent, strong woman. And honestly, sort of more like who I am. You know what I mean? So I could relate to the character a little more. And it was such a, 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 a goofy kind of story. And that, it, and different, you know, it, it encompasses so many different genres from horror to comedy to totally it is you know um definitely the teenage valley girl thing was in there but um and the zombies and and while we were shooting the thing um the producers really kind of wanted to lean more horror um and Tom Eberhardt, who directed it and wrote it that was never his intention he didn't want it to be like a, a just a regular horror movie he wanted it to have that sort of tongue-in-cheek sense of humor so there, while we were shooting we would shoot some scenes in two different ways but I feel like so that we're so fortunate that you know Tom was able to stand up for himself and put out the product that he really wanted to put out because it's so unique and again it's one of these um I, I think it's inspiring in a way, but it's also super funny. But also the fact that the two protagonists are female. Um, at the time, I didn't really think about it, but that's been a lot of feedback that I get at conventions and things like that, that um, like a lot of women will come up and say it was very inspiring to see two strong girls that were just girls, you know, not 
super women or anything like that, um, that could take care of themselves. And a lot of the attitude I feel like in Hollywood is, you know, the audience is young men, you've got to always have a male lead and that's, that's what you've got to do. But those are all men saying that, first of all. And the other, the feedback that I get from the fans is guys love it. They love it. That, I mean, why is that threatening or whatever the, the, you know, the big cheeses think that strong women portray is going to be threatening or something to men? I don't know. At any rate. Um, yeah. Again, the whole VHS thing, right. um, it, it really, there was a brother sister who came to a convention that Kelly and I were at. And they had watched it so many times, they did their own like little stick figure cartoon book with all the scenes in it. They were so excited to see us because it was a part of the, a huge part of their childhood. You know, I start thinking about this really quickly and I'm going to go to the Greg. I think that they took the way the villains were of the zombies, kind of like what the Matrix was later. That mm. kind of the way that, I'm just thinking about it, the way that they were mm. really more more animated, more kind of funny in a way. I, like, you know, how the, you know, how the Matrix, how they were chasing the stars. I kind of saw certain things. And, and that's what happens in movies, right? That, that yeah, yeah. Specific points of certain show movies. And then add later, it comes back to life based on the director or producer or whatever, right? Right, for sure. I mean, it, when you, it, so I had that scene in the alley where I'm fighting a zombie and it's like, you know, he wants to eat me. And I'm like, oh, shit, I got to beat him up. You know, it's funny. It's funny. Yeah. And we, I love shooting that scene too because it was very physical. The guy who played the zombie was a um, a, um, a stunt guy, so I felt safe with him. But I did all that. The only thing I didn't do was ride a motorcycle. I didn't know how to ride a motorcycle. So, yeah. but I did all. If there were any stunts, I did the stunts, and we learned how to shoot those little Mac tens. You know, we had to go learn how to do all that. Um, it was so much fun. And again, um, Kelly and I are still really good friends. And so, I, and I'm still in touch with Tom Everhart. And we had a reunion about five years ago um, in California. And it, 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 they screened it. And it was so much fun to see everybody again. Have you uh, learned how to ride a motorcycle now? Or it's just not on the cards? <laughs> <laughs> I think I do old now. But even at the time, I was like, wow, these things weigh a lot. I couldn't even, I had a boyfriend back then that had a motorcycle and I couldn't even hold it up. Mm. <laughs> I was, I guess, so delicate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's jump to Weekend and Bernie's. So I'm going to ask Greg, right. did you see this in the theaters, Greg? I did. Yeah. So this is what, like around 1986, roughly? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. 89, somewhere in there. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. 86, 87, something like that. For sure. Yeah. yeah I'm just yeah. what Rican and Burney is just, it's just so funny. And I, I just, it's so iconic. And, you know, specifically, and it's been referenced in things forever. Oh my gosh. I, they're still doing it. You know, <laughs> they're, they're Birdie is Joe Biden right now. In yeah. some ads. I mean, it's just I hilarious. saw the pictures just the other day. Yeah. I know. It's hilarious. It cracks me up. And, uh, you know, uh, the politician Bernie was Weekend at Bernie's. I mean, they really have milked it for all it's worth, I have to say. And as you say, it's, it's referenced in so many so many different places like from television shows to like friends you know the his oh, what's his name uh i forget the character but his favorite movie was weekend at bernie's <laughs> <laughs> i love that um yeah so that's so much fun when you see that you know that but, even yeah. if yeah it was a male cast except then if you look on the list on uh at least on wikipedia you're right down on the list, right? Is the first woman on that, right? So yeah, that, for sure. That, and Wikipedia doesn't do, do it justice for how much of the starring role you had in that. So tell us about it. Remind, remind me what you, uh, your character in Weekend Bernie's for people. Yeah, um, Gwen. I was going to go, oh, I hope I remember her name. Because <laughs> it was a while ago. Um, Gwen, yes. 
Uh, well, I can start with telling you about the audition process there. Ah, okay. Um, yeah. So I was asked to go in and read for Ted Kotcheff, the director. So I didn't have to go through the whole, um, you know, meeting the casting director and then Pat. It was Ted Kotcheff and Jonathan Silverman. So I guess it was kind of like a chemistry meeting or something like that. And I was excited because I hadn't done a comedy before. And, uh, you know, Ted Kotcheff, it was huge, as was Jonathan Silverman. I knew Andrew McCarthy was connected to it. So I thought this, I can't screw this up. So I get there and it was really nice and everybody was super nice and everything. And then they, he, uh, Ted asked us to read a scene together and I just kind of froze and I just screwed it up completely. And I was like, oh, no, no. Um, and I left there. I called my manager immediately. I'm saying, you you have to call them. You have to ask uh, ask them if I can come back and read again because I screwed the thing up. I was really, really upset. And my manager was like, yeah, 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 okay. And the next day, I had the job. Oh, was, <laughs> oh my gosh. But yeah, I was totally panicked for that. So, um, so you know, cut to a month later or something, we're in New York, which was kind of cool. I, New York, you know, in the 80s was kind of a scary place. So I, being kind of the, I was sort of naive and young and from Canada. So you could say that like taxi drivers and things would be like, so where are you from? I'm like, oh, I'm from Canada. <laughs> They're like, Slender, <laughs> where are you going? Well, they think it's just up the block. Where going <laughs> you know like literally they would take me on the longest possible route that was back in the days when it wasn't all you know they they have it all like uh, figured out now where you just really can't take advantage of somebody in that way um it, it was kind of a scary place new york for me at that time but i sure had fun shooting that movie and then we moved to like wilmington north carolina which was supposed to be long island you know um, and they just kept me, I, I didn't work all the time, but they just kept me there and they didn't want to fly me back and forth from LA. So that was really fun. And like I said, Jonathan was the sweetest guy. Um, Ted Kotcheff was kind of a bear, you know, he's like, Rrr. he, he, um, could lose his temper very easily, but <laughs> it, it, in general, it was super fun. Wow. That's, that's phenomenal. So what are some of your latest projects that you're working on now? Yeah. Um, well, I have a, <laughs> something that's sort of uh, in the air right now. I can't say, well, there's a couple of projects that are sort of, you can't talk about because, you know, there's NDAs and things like that and, and attached to them and stuff. So there's a couple of things. Um, uh, one is a, a TV series that's brand new and one is, a commercial thing. Um, but I've also like with COVID when COVID happened, because there was so much downtime, I decided to work on a script. And I spent a lot of time working on a script that was optioned by a, a production company in Canada. Actually, we wanted to try to uh, I was working with a producer that I worked with on a movie called mischief that I did years ago. And he wanted to make it a movie that could be made in Canada. So a Canadian production company optioned that. So we've been, you know, fine tuning that whole thing. Um, I just, in a way, it was like a very creative time for me. I mean, a lot of people felt trapped. I felt just like I had the freedom. I wasn't distracted by other kinds of work and I could really sit and focus on scripts and, and TV show ideas and things like that. And directing, like I directed a, a short for a friend of mine. Um, I, that's something that I just loved so much um, that I want to do more of that. So uh, yeah, it's it's been busy. It's, it's uh, um, I keep very, I feel like I keep very, very busy. I mean, I'm not really on a series or anything at the moment, but if, if somebody asked me what I did today, I, I, it's just like, I don't know, but I wish, you know, a day was like 24 hours longer. Yeah, there's not enough time. Yeah. 
I think all yeah. three of us would say that. And uh, yeah, because the people that want to stay busy can find, keep themselves busy. And it's good to be busy, yeah. isn't it, Greg? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I'm excited to welcome filmmaker from Clear Cut, Brian Skiba. Brian, thanks for stopping by. And uh, let's talk about the story of how you got involved in Clear Cut. Uh, very, very beautiful background. Great setting for a movie. That's for sure. Uh, getting to see the the, the beautiful uh, forest and trees. Something different than other films sometimes. Yeah, no, I appreciate you having me on, Neil. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was definitely a process where it was like, you know, um, you, you know, I, I was asked to find a thr action thriller script and, um, you know, this one kind of spoke to me. And, and for those reasons, it was like, man, I, I, I grew up in the, in the, in the forest. So, you know, I was a boy scout. I, I hiked a lot. And so to have this kind of uh, film that was going to be mainly based in, in the forest was, uh, was, uh, was very attractive. And, and, um, and so, uh, you know, it, I, I'm glad it all came together. So. So were you the one, did they approach you for this film, whoever wrote the film or how, kind of how, they, how did that go? Um, so initially, uh, I, Corey Large, one of the producers came to me and said, I, you know, let's make a film together. I want to do an action thriller. That's kind of Corey's deal. And so I, I started doing a search, you know, and I called my, all my, uh, all my usual contacts for great scripts. And I reached out to Eric Bromberg who wrote, who wrote the second, which is the film I did with Ryan Phillippe. And, um, and he's like, oh, I got this great one. It's perfect action thriller. And he sent he sent me the script, and uh, it wasn't written by him. It was written by Joe, but um, you know, I, I I read it and I was like, I agree. And so I sent it to uh, Corey, and he got it covered, and the coverage came back great. And and that was that was kind of the process. And you know, absolutely. So let's talk about the premise of the film without giving it away. I think you you really got to stay. Uh, pay attention throughout as I previewed the film uh, because there's a lot of storylines that you could miss if you decided to go to the bathroom for a second. That's for sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, But that's good because you kind of really have a lot of different uh, storylines and really understanding this character, the main character. So talk about it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, for sure. Uh, you, you definitely want to pause. You don't want to just walk away. Uh, you know, if you got to use a restroom. But it's, 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 you know, that, and that's what attracted me to it was, was it, it wasn't just a superficial kind of action film. I think, I think a lot of these days you, you turn on the action films and, and you think, okay, this is what I'm going to, you know, you, 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 you're, you, it's, it's a guy trapped in a, trapped in a building and there's no characters at all kind of thing. And then this thing, it was like, it was wide open and, and I found there was an opportunity for a lot of symbolism, you know, to dig in between Clive's past and the actual visuals that you're watching and, and all the running and, and kind of running away from his past and, and, and seeking redemption and, and things like this. And so, um, and the way it's kind of told to where it's, it, it's, you know, where it leaves you kind of guessing as to why is this guy taking a logging job when he's in his forties, you know, I mean, it's, right. It's, it, it 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 um it definitely uh you know leaves leaves you guessing at moments and so yeah there's 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 um there's some meat on the bone and and, and that's what's fun about it you know? and then i think clive did a great job of uh, you know throughout the movie with the flashbacks and different things to really get people thinking what kind of character is this kind of guy you know is he a good guy is he a bad guy it's very hard to identify that through because we got to see the story of that person you know not just the be, before and then the after he stuck in the forest trying to save his life you know what i mean so that's the thing i think that really brings it home in so many ways without giving things away right 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 no i mean it really is one of those you know um you know there, there's lots of gray there's lots of gray in his character. And, and that's what I think. I think that's true to life with everybody. And that's what makes characters interesting. You know, if, you know, so, you know, I think, I think long gone is the lone ranger. You know, it's, it's a, you know, he's, he's very gray. And you learned a little bit about forestry in this as well. At the beginning, if you didn't like read like the, the what the premise of the movie was or anything before watching it, you think, Oh, okay. And then it just hits you. Right. <laughs> 
Yeah, you get, no. you get, you get a little bit of a of understanding the character Alec played at the beginning, and and really he kind of educated us a little bit about the Northwest in certain ways and what how dangerous this job is. Oh be- yeah, no, I mean it's it's super dangerous. And when I first started scouting and I and I started meeting these guys for real, the forestry workers and and the loggers and. I mean, they're all missing fingers and thumbs and they all have stories of guys just, you know, either dead or, or handicapped forever. I mean, it's, it's, it's for real. I mean, it's, it's, it's a dangerous job. It's not a. And how much is that's done on a regular basis? Because we want to preserve our forest. Right. And then it looks like yeah. it's, 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 that's the, that's where the line can be drawn and saying, well, what's fair in this type of business, right? Because we want to have these beautiful forests that are preserved in other countries that are not really in the United States. Yeah. So this was in Canada. This was Victoria, Canada. And and uh, and I asked them the exact same question. I was like, because you you go to the you go to where they log and you see big, big tracks of trees that are missing, and then you see right next to it a, a lush forest. And, every, and and what I got told, I was like, man, I mean, you know, and they're, they're like, no, 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 no. There's, they're like on that mountain right there, there is not an original tree. You know, everything here has been logged at least twice. And, and it's, and, it, and the, I guess what the deal is, it takes 70 years for these trees to grow back to a point oh to where they goodness. can be logged again. And so what they do is they log, they replant. And, and then they allow the trees to grow and, and 70 years later, they log it again. And so, um, you know, it was, it was kind of crazy. They actually had sections uh, that the Canadian government, you know, that cordoned off that were actually original, you know, they were original trees and then everything else was, was logged. And, and, and so, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting process. I got to listen to the first five episodes of Unsinkable. And they're awesome. So I'm excited to welcome John Malson and Misha Crosby. Guys, thanks for stopping by. And uh, this is so well done. And now I'm just wanting to know more, especially being a historian, meaning I have an undergrad in history, John. And it's just, I never learned about this before uh, in the history books, this story. Right. Well, straight out of school, I, I joined the, the British Merchant Navy. I was a deck officer for 11 years, and uh, 13 years, and I, I graduated uh, and I qualified as the ship's captain. And I knew this story. It's kind of baked into our DNA a bit. Um, and there was a movie version of the story that made back in 1943, which was really a propaganda piece for the, for the Merchant Navy. It was, it was fine. Um, so I did know about it. And I started to work on issues about the Merchant Navy and their losses during the, war, the Second World War way back in 2008 and started to write bits and pieces about it. And I then started to develop it as a full length feature film for screenplay in 2011, 12. I expanded it up into a TV version because there was this extraordinary court case that takes place uh, just after it. Um, and that, so that's the backstory of how this came to be. Oh, wow. And uh, how did uh, you guys connect? You two connect. We've known each other for many years. Uh, the Brits seem to find each other in LA. There's almost like a homing beacon that seems to go out. But uh, I think it was probably 2011 uh, I, uh, or there or thereabouts. Uh, we worked on actually a short project that John had put together and have since, you know, John's been a part of a, a feature that we uh, we put out at Detura that went to Lionsgate. We've worked on various things over the years until he sent me his script, his feature film script, The San Demetrio, uh, and uh, he eventually convinced me to read it. And I'm very glad I did. Right. And kind of not to give everything away, John, tell us the background of the story. Because, you know, when you think about ships and you think about a sinkable ship, you think about the Titanic. But this yeah. is unsinkable, which is great, right? I guess the Brits win in one thing for sure now because we, you know, the Titanic in a lot of the US, but kind of explain specifically how this uh the the story without giving everything away sure well obviously this is this takes place in november 1940 so it's it's early days pretty early days during the war uh the united states hasn't come in uh the brits we're on our own pretty much by then france and europe has been completely overrun um and we were dependent utterly on on the sea trade supply lines and ships were coming from a lot of them from the states and canada um, across to the, to the UK in convoy, protected by the by the Royal Navy, by the warships of the Royal Navy, and in this instance, the uh, the San Demetrio, the ship involved, 
She joined a convoy which set out from Halifax in Canada in uh, November 1940. There's 38 ships protected, sadly, by just one elderly warship, which was, in fact, a converted passenger ship, the Jervis Bay. And that that, uh, convoy got halfway across the ocean before it was jumped by a brand new German battleship, the Admiral Scheer. And obviously things went horribly wrong. That's the start of the story. And maybe I don't go any further than that uh, at the stitch. No, I definitely don't think you should go any further. But uh, again, the way I love just to listen to this story, it just reminds you back. We're really, I guess, through podcasts and audio, we're really going back in history in a lot of ways to what people enjoyed listening to back in the day where history's like repeating itself when you agree Misha yeah I mean we really wanted to try and create an experience that people could could tune into you know if it, if it could be a family event we would love that we understand listening habits have changed but um we tried to go out here and put out something of the uh the highest standards and the, the highest cinematic standards at that right we we worked with Sound designers who, uh, you know, have done a lot of work on James Bond, on uh, on Wonder Woman, on uh, on actually Band of Brothers, uh, HBO's show, which is where we initially got drawn to Jimmy Boyle and his team. They had some some wonderful World War II, you know, libraries in there, which was so specific and it was really useful for what for what we needed. You know, you add in there then Stephen Endelman's uh, composition, of which you know this entire thing is fully scored, like fully orchestrally scored as well at that. So you have all of that instrumentation lined up uh, in the timeline from your violins to your cellos to your percussion to all of that. When you when you break this thing down, you know, you've got with between that, the effects, the the hundred different roles, you've got hundreds of tracks deep on this uh, this timeline before it gets reduced into then what gets uh, put out to the uh, to the audience. So, John, how important was it for you to depict your story to sound the best possible? That's got to be huge. How many times you went through it to make sure it's exactly what you like? It's, uh, well, production in terms of, well, pre-production, rewriting the screenplay and starting to build the, the, the concept of it, taking out the idea of having, um, r- removing narration completely, trying to work out how to tell the story without narration, um, and in a cinematic way as possible, but without clunky de- exposition. Um, that obviously took a long time. It took us nearly five or so months to record all 37 actors, all over 100 roles, uh, everybody separately. It was COVID, so people were in individual studios. Uh, then the post-production, Misha can talk to more, but we worked on that for over a year to get that into a shape that we felt was as good as it could possibly be. And we decided, I think, pretty much from the outset, that we were going to go with the concept of making something that maybe had never been made before, which was, which is an audio movie. Yeah. So that's the, I'm going to, I want to ask Misha that question, but I'm going to ask that question. What is an audio movie? Cause you know, I'm a podcaster. I started out in radio. I start. I was a podcast at the same time as radio. Now we've gone to this production audio movie Define that. So it was a term that came up from uh, a BBC radio uh, guy called uh, Jack Bowman who'd come over to the US and talked to uh, John and I uh, about the project and it was a, it was around when you know covid had just hit the world and all of a sudden our plans to move this into you know a feature film production had been put on hold he said if you, you guys thought about doing this as an audio movie and we're like what the hell's an audio movie and he proceeded to tell us he said well imagine uh, a production with full cinematic sound design with orchestral score possibly putting it out in dolby atmos as well but just without the pictures and we're like okay let's let's sort of break that down and see if that's even possible and we we kind of for something that was so you know action centric as this as it is in its moments it's I, I wouldn't go as far as saying it's you know it's, a, it's 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 full action all the way through as you know but there are there are moments that are very complicated some of these sequences where you have very large ships and very visual sequences and we wanted to see if that was even going to be possible to translate in an audio sphere so we did a little test just even a, for ourselves um very early on in that process just had a few actors uh, locally in LA record some of them under covers at the time send us uh, send us back some performances and then led in some very basic sound design and um 
uh, well, I say basic, it, it wasn't bad at all, but uh, we, uh, we added in some, some score as well just to see if it could work. And sure enough, it was visually translating uh, quite cinematically. And so it was a path then we decided to go down again and try and bring in uh, you know, some of the most talented, uh, talented people in the world from the, uh, the film world. Yeah. And John, I remember sometimes when I was driving in the car of my kids and they're watching a movie, I'm listening. I could tell there's something different when I was previewing this today, listening to the, the five. And I'm like, wow, this sound quality. It feels like I could be closing my eyes and watching a movie while closing yeah. my eyes. You really, th yeah. that's the yeah. level it is. Yeah, and we did a lot of listening with our eyes closed to make sure it worked, you know, and is that, and, and adjusting the sound slightly. It's like we're not quite hearing enough of the flames here or the sea isn't quite there or it's coming from slightly the wrong direction. Um, and when we were recording the actors, because of my background in the Merchant Navy, I was able to give them the physical environments. So how far apart are they? How much background noise is there? Are, are they surrounded by metal or wood? Um, how loud do they need to be? as well as the accuracy of how people talk to that at that time well, and, the, and the technical stuff. Whereas Misha, um, his, he has had a great uh, ear for truthful performance and appropriate performance. So we worked together completely in lockstep throughout the production and post-production era, uh, era, getting this as good as we possibly could and making every moment as truthful and as uh, inclusive as, as, as possible. Absolutely. And Misha, the cast is unbelievable. They're so, well, uh, finding that cast, was that a challenge? A little bit. Uh, it, uh, it was just a lot of persistence, really, is the best way I can put that. You know, there's, uh, there's a classic saying in Hollywood, everyone loves to be first to be second, right? And so after we, uh, we signed Brian, of which when I called John and told him, it was amazing to hear a grown man's voice go up about four octaves as he physically ascended to the table that he was dancing on. And then, you know, from there, we were able to, you know, bring on some of those other names that you, uh, that you have, you know, uh, from, from Malkovich to Thomas to Natalie, who were, were, actually, were on our list as well to, uh, to cast. And quite frankly, now, you know, with that cast set in, and, and Thomas, as you as you know, is uh, is very much playing the uh, the lead of this. It's really difficult for us to envisage uh, anybody doing uh, doing a better job. He really um, embodies that role so well. It's almost like like Thomas was born to play somebody of that era. Yeah, wow, John, you got you got to be happy where it's going, and now the next phase. So define how people. Uh, can listen to this. How does it work for an audio movie? Is it available on a pod a podcast network? Or is it available on download? How does it go for people? To so it, it's, it's going to be available on Wondery Plus. The first two episodes come out uh, on the tenth on Wednesday, two days time, uh, worldwide via YouTube links, but feeding back into Wondery, and they'll be available for everyone to listen to for free um, with no commercials. After that, it comes out weekly on Wondery Plus for 90 days. So it'll be available purely on Wondery Plus for 90 days. And after that, it, it will go worldwide. Uh, you know, so, but you can get to it via any of your usual sources if you go to uh, Apple Music uh, or to Spotify and so forth. And we are, we are the, um, uh, the flagship on the American storytellers. Um, history storytellers. History storytellers oh, that wow. Wondery are doing. And so there's a whole lot of other great shows as well coming out. Uh, on Wondery Plus, on, uh, but we're kind of the first, the first one to come out. Coming out on, on Wednesday. So, Misha, there's going to be others on Wondery Plus that are going to be audio movies as well. No. I wouldn't say audio movies, but certainly like they have a history centric theme to them. Uh -huh. So that was part of uh, the uh, the campaign that they wanted to run with uh, Unsinkable being the flagship show for them. All right. So I want to break this down without giving it away. I love that you incorporate the characters to really. This is where I was like, okay, I'm listening to an audio movie. Let me get through that. Oh my. Then by the time the fifth episode came, I'm like, no, I want to keep listening that you really involve the characters to really live through this, John, and really live what's going to happen. How did they deal with it? Not just on the ships, but also at home. 
and really gave you a good story of that. How did like that to really tell that story and take it and make it take place of really understanding, you know, there are wives out there waiting for them. And I think it's a story that you wouldn't think when you read the beginning thing, thinking, do they are we really going to get into those lives in an audio movie? And you did. Yeah, I wanted to. I mean, part of it is my, it comes from my family background. My parents were both, uh, and their entire my entire family at that level. That all my aunts and uncles were utterly in, in you know in uniform and engaged. My father was a doctor in the in the, in the paratroopers. My mother was in the, was a, 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 in the women's Royal Navy and worked as a code breaker at Bletchley Park. All my uncles were in the Royal Navy, and all their friends were. And I can remember, for example, my aunt telling the story of how she got married in the middle of the worst bombing by Germany during the daytime in November at, the, at that time. And there, that's a reason why you will find there actually is a you know, wedding takes place. And that's as pretty much as related to me by my aunt. So I had this truthful history to draw on, but at the same time, I, I thought it was so vital that not only do the guys who suffered and, and gave so much to the, to the, to this country, to our country to keep us alive during the war, but the sacrifices of the people back home. I wanted to tell that story, that side of it as well. Yeah. And that's where it's going. And then I'm thinking I have all of it. Right. And then you guys had to just give me only a piece of it. I mean, I'm like, Oh my goodness, because then I'm like, okay, I, I got through this meaning I'm enjoying this. And then I'm like, this didn't give me an ending. You always have an ending, but I'm also could see me go back and listen again. Unlike a movie, an audio movie might give you an opportunity because people are at work. They might be working on something. They might miss a specific spot and they'll go back again. Did you guys ever think if you guys coin this audio movie, it might have an opportunity to be listened to more times than once, Misha? We, we, we hope so. Like there, There's certainly a lot of specificity and depth in there for the people that want to give it not only a second listen, but give it the attention that we, we hope that they will. Uh, it was interesting. We've had a few people uh, now uh, have some early preview listens of this in the press, and they said to, uh, said to us, "Listen, we were we were planning on getting some other stuff done while we had this on in the background, and after about you know a minute or two, we very much realized that wasn't going to be the case." And they 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 sat down and they said, "No, I was into it. And I was listening intently." And listen, there's there's a surface level you can listen to this at, and that's absolutely fine. But if you take the time uh, to uh, to invest in it. Uh, we really hope you'll get some uh, return for your ears uh, because there's certainly um, some some specificity, even down to some of the 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 sound effects that are used. Uh, for instance, there's there's a scene where some some specific engines are going over above some Rolls Royce Maryland engines uh, from from fighter jets at the time. Those are those real engines that you will find going above you. There are specific types of guns from that era that are used. Absolutely, the real real sound effects. And um, so, yeah, there's there's detailed work for those that want to explore. Do you? Uh, what I think that th what brings the table, John, is that you, that you it's so well done in the hope. And who knows where audio movies are going to go? And you'll be the first, right? That's your hope, right? Saying okay. Uh, we're so, we're yeah. so pleased by the reaction we're getting from people who have been given the first five episodes that people are saying, you know what, this is groundbreaking. This is new. I've never heard anything so so movie-like in the audio sphere before. And so we're really pleased that people are agreeing with what we have hoped people would think, which is, yeah, this is an audio movie. And we've had a lot of people come to us and say, you know what, this would be great for the visually impaired. Yes. Um, Oh, yeah. And maybe we would love to have it out and, you know, put it out in a sort of limited release in the, in movie houses so that people can come to the, come yeah. to the, come to the theater and sit and listen, maybe to the whole thing at one go, because I, we think that would be an experience people would really enjoy. I hope this ends up more in the history books in the U S history books of you're a teacher that listens to my show still because of, you know, you've been downloading it as more education podcast back in the day. And you've been listening to me for over 15 years if you're an S and you're in education, you definitely need to share this with your classes in history. That's no doubt. And I think that this should have been these, this should have been the history books, especially in the U S I'm sure it was in British history books, but not in the U S history as much to talk about this. Cause this was such an important part to understand what happened on the Naval fights in, uh, during world war II. I'm getting really interested in films and, you know, sometimes people don't know the difference between like a, 
a, a full length feature and what is a short film? Well, our guest today, Taryn Jackson from PBS is going to talk about PBS's short film festival that's coming out July 15th, uh, all the way to the 26th. How are you, Taryn? Thanks for stopping by. How are you? I am doing well. How are you doing, Neil? Fantastic. So tell me a little bit about your background. Let's learn a little bit about who you are, and then we'll go into the film festival. Okay, great. Well, um, my name is Taryn Jackson. I'm currently Director of Editorial and Brand Engagement. I cannot believe I'm about to say this, but I started at PBS almost 16 years ago. Um, in 2008, I graduated from Howard University um, back in 2003. Um, worked a couple of different places, but once I found my home in public media, I've been here ever since. Started out doing um, production assistant work, doing QA for video when we um, initially launched our first video um, portal. <laughs> we call it our video, we used to call it our video ecosystem. <laughs> We've grown um, since then, but that that's how I started at PBS, doing a lot of QA work, um, and then started running uh, the PBS.org homepage, making sure that uh, the priorities for us were right front and center for everyone, newsletters as well, and the PBS Short Film Festival. It launched in 2012, and I'm excited to bring to you all year 13 of the film festival. All right. So let's kind of just jump right into the, to you talking about the film festival and everything. Uh, what now we're talking short film festival because in case people could hear. Uh, so can define a short for me. Absolutely. So a short is anywhere between we've had shorts as short as two minutes. Um, usually the sweet spot is between like eight to 12 minutes. There have been some films that we've led into the film festival that have been on the 20 minute side, but that's not often. And that's not usually how long shorts are. So that eight to 12 minute spot is the sweet spot. And let me tell you, these aren't trailers. These are not, you know, shortened versions of feature length films. These are full films that run anywhere from, like I said, three minutes all the way up to a good, you know, 15, 20 minutes. They tell a us uh, a pack, impactful, strong, powerful story in a short amount of time. And so that's why this year's theme is story time. We're celebrating the art of short form storytelling because there is an art to that. Not everyone can do it. And these filmmakers have done an incredible job. Well, and that's where we see the short between 30 seconds and a minute in social media and how you have to have the hook you have to get them and then get them a call to action this is even more difficult because you're putting it all together in a way that you're going to hook them keep them engaged and then at the end uh give them the the fine finale in it but we do see a lot of shorter films do well now you talked about specifically the time period what kind of short films do you allow to enter the film festival? Is there a specific rule of thumb on that? You know what? We are a very straightforward film festival. We want the stories that the people want to tell. And so we don't put, you know, parameters around what people can enter into the film festival. Um, so they work with their local PBS station are some of our presenting partners, um, including the National Multicultural Alliance, as well as POV and ITVS. The independent filmmakers will partner um, with one of our presenting partners and submit their film for consideration for the film festival. So then here at PBS, um, eight or nine of us, we get together. Well, actually, let me say that we do not get together. We independently watch the films initially. And then after we score and rank them on our own, we come together and we meet. Pro that meeting is probably a good two and a half, three hour meeting where we whittle down um, our 100 to 125 entries into to this year our 15 films from there from the 15 then we see do they fit into genres do they fit into themes can we fit them into categories because we don't want to do that work first because i feel like when you do the categories on the front end sometimes you're trying to fit films you know and that we don't want it to be that way we want this film festival to be authentic so it comes together organically and that's the way we like to present it to everyone no doubt, because if it comes together organically, it's a lot of an easier uh, type of a, a, a situation because and then it's their it's their tribe. It's the story they're trying to tell the audience. I'm sure you're looking at how am I really looking at something that could be PBS worthy when you're going through these 125, because what PBS is able to do is tell stories that some people don't tell. 
right? That can't get on the mainstream potentially can, does not go into what's most important to PBS, which is our, the whole culture of PBS, not just, you know, okay, is this going to be really a lot of views, right? Or is this going to be so controversial? No. Are we telling a story that people who are the, the people who watch PBS on a regular basis, why they tune into PBS versus other places? Am I correct? That's it. That's perfect. That's perfect. And, you know, as the director of editorial and brand engagement, you know, I take that responsibility very seriously. That is in, literally in my title, that PBS brand piece is so important. And so when it comes to the film festival, that is it. You know, we want to get out of the way. Actually, we get out of the way so that the filmmakers and these storytellers can tell their stories. We're just providing the trusted platform. We're providing the visibility. And we want to make sure that these films they're told from a place, you know, and we do. We were, it's not all serious. We have light, funny films that, you know, you, that are going to make you laugh and, you know, that are just like fun to throw around. There's animation. But then we also have films that are on the heavier side where they're going to spark conversation, um, maybe spark people into action, you know, if they feel you know, if they feel the need. So there's something for everyone. And I always say with this film festival, you know, I can tell whether I'm doing my job if you see yourself or someone you love represented in at least one film. So I just want to make sure that that is what, you know, we do for the film festival and keeping the main thing, the main thing. And that is making sure that we have at least, you know, one film that resonates with everyone. Then hopefully after that one film, you'll jump out there even further and explore and maybe stumble upon something that you didn't even know that you'd be interested in and then go from there. So that's the, that I love that spirit of a film yeah. festival. That's the, you know, that's the most fun part for me. What tips would you provide filmmakers to make sure that they have it can make the cut? That's a great question. So, you know, one of the things is always make sure, like, think about how, what makes you the person to tell the story you want to tell. How how are you going to bring your own self, your own um, you know genius, your own creativity into this story, right? Because there's some stories that you think, oh, I've heard this is you know a million times. They're telling the same story over and over again. If you can tell it from a place where only you can do it, you will find that that story will grab people's attention, even if the subject matter may be similar or something that you know people have heard over and over again, you bringing your full self to your story, that is what makes the difference. I always tell people, trust your voice, trust your voice. Yeah. Don't worry about, you know, anyone else's. You tell your story the way you want to tell it and it will get, you know, it will get the visibility that it deserves. All right. Best place we can find information on the PBS uh, Short Film Festival. Where can we go? Yes. So lots of different ways. So all of the films will be available July 15th on the PBS app as well as our PBS YouTube channel. We also have a dedicated PBS Short Film Festival Facebook page. And then we have our show page, pbs.org slash film festival. All right. Thanks again. Appreciate it.